the death of George Floyd and after millions of Americans protested against police brutality and systemic racism, American newsrooms began interrogating how they covered the black community. That are starting out in the business to have both broadcast experience or video production experience, as well as the ability to write articles. Partnership with the Google News Initiative. The Boot Camp is an eight week fully remote program that provides guidance and support to launch news businesses that serve your community's needs. The Knight Foundation is a, an organization that's based in the United States that funds local journalism, the future of local journalism, and we're, we're, we're focused on the financial sustainability of local journalism. There are a number of philanthropic organizations in the United States that fund journalism. Many of them fund around topics like climate, racial justice, um, policing, uh, gun control, education, but the Knight Foundation is clearly focused on the financial sustainability of the future of local news. So I just wanted to start with our strategy and we focus on US organizations. A couple of other things. Um, many, many years ago, there weren't that many nonprofit newsrooms. Today, there are many. There are hundreds of local newsrooms springing up every day. We believe very much in the power of networks. That means, of course, learning from the community, learning from your peers. We also believe in collaboration. That came through in our, our last panel. Um, uh, Jim Brady, the vice president of, of Knight, Foundation, Knight Foundation's journalism pr program moderated that last panel. And we also, um, we believe very much in shared tools and resources, which is what this conversation is about. So I'm not gonna go over bios, but we have three presentations today. We have Emily Dressler, who's here from RevLab at, at Texas Tribune. We have Fernando Diaz, who's here to talk about WordPress and Automatic. And we have Lisa Heyamoto from Lion Publishers. And we're, we, we sort of, this was Lisa's genius idea. So she's gonna talk about the map. She's gonna talk about the route. And he's gonna talk about the backpack of your journey as local news publishers. So we'll start, first we need a map. So let's start with Emily Dressler of RevLab. See this? Okay. Um, so yes, thank you. thanks, Karen. Thank you, Lisa, for coming up with our framework for today. So we're going to kind of talk through roughly a map or where do we start when we're looking for resources for our organization, the route, how do we get to where we want to go? And then finally, the backpack, what are the critical tools we need to bring with us sort of along that way? Um, oh, I'm doing both. I'm going to try to multitask here. I am in the way. So let's go to the next slide. So what is RevLab? And we'll just keep running through these slides really quickly. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Oh, yes. So um, the RevLab is a journalism support organization. Um, somewhat uniquely, we're based at a newsroom, which is the Texas Tribune, uh, which is located here in Austin and just down the street from the state capitol, which the, the team there covers. Um, so being based with the Texas Tribune, we start by sharing the best practices on sustainability that have been developed at the Texas Tribune over the last 12 years. Um, they have a strong history of sharing not only their content, but their ideas, their learnings. As you, if some of you who saw April's presentation yesterday on revenue, they're an open book and they open their books for all to see and talk about how they got there. Um, so this is a, a crude attempt at a large map. And we know this is only one small piece of that map. So we're always trying to chart this map better, but these sort of represent a lot of the associations, the funders, the trainers that support US newsrooms with support and they support beyond the US. Um, I know at the RevLab, we've worked with folks outside of the US. We work with nonprofits, for-profits, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to quickly share with you, I've only been at the RevLab for about four or five months. Um, we've really worked hard with the team there and with the Texas Tribune staff to sort of reframe our approach. And really our approach is to add to that 
that big map that I just shared with you and not duplicate efforts. So we really wanna collaborate with all of those associations, like my folks sitting up here on the panel today. Um, one way we do that too is by building connections. We get calls and I underestimated the amount of calls that come in to the Texas Tribune every day from startups, from legacy media outlets, or from people just thinking about media, um, saying, where do I start? How do I, what do we do? Um, so in, towards that middle circle, we, we sort of serve as wayfinders and help point people to the right resources. We do not wanna go out and recreate the many great playbooks, the training programs, um, the things that Lion is doing. We want to point people to Lion, for example, or collaborate with them on some new stuff. And we're, we're gonna get to that. Um, and then finally, we're all, and all of us up here at this table today are really focused on the long-term sustainability that supports journalism. It's just as simple as that. So how do we do that? Four ways we work, um, sustained engagements. This is my favorite. We work as sort of a central team for organizations um, over, the course of months or even years. Um, we're working with a cohort right now, the API REJ Listening Lab. It's for publishers. We talk to them all the time and it's, re it's really one of the most rewarding pieces of my job. Um, the second one is convening. Again, we'll, we'll come to this. I wanna share some exciting stuff we're working on with you, but um, we bring together cohorts for training, collaboration and really building community. I mean, that's why we're all here today or all here at ISOJ. Um, there's strength in our numbers and what we can share with each other. Um, the wayfinding is sticking with our map theme is how we, we point you to where you need to go to get you started. And um, finally, this is a really interesting part of being attached to a newsroom like the Texas Tribune. Um, we, the RevLab serves as project managers on new initiatives. Um, that way we can be a part of that process and then share those results with all of you. Um, when we get through some testing. For example, right now we're working on a large audience survey to um, look at underserved Texas, um, underserved communities in Texas and how we can better serve them with our news. Um, and we hope through the Rav Lab to share those results with you once we finish. So finally, the next slide, just really quickly, I wanted to share with you um, a couple things we're working on, and I, I know some of you have heard about this and more is to come as these things are just being put together, but um, we're, we're partnering for the first time with Lion News Rev Hub to put on a sustainability summit in October here in Austin. Um, our, our other partner is the Knight Foundation who is partnering with us to put on this event the first of its kind. We hope to bring together business and editorial um, leaders of their news orgs to come together to really push the needle on sustainability and have that business person and that editorial person walk out the door with three great things they're going to attempt in, in the next year to accomplish um, ways to support their journalism. And then we're also, Neil's in the room here, we're also putting together a new statewide news collective named TBD. I'm taking um, suggestions for what we call it. Um, we're going to bring together, we've worked with Spotlight PA um, and Neil's team and several other groups. And we're gonna bring together folks who are covering a statewide audience. Um, we share some unique challenges and probably some unique opportunities. Um, and we'll come together and try to um, build that segment of the media industry. So that, that's it for me. Let's now, let's, let's, let's go to our route. Thanks, Emily. That was wonderful. Um, hello. Welcome. We're so glad you are all here in person and uh, virtually as well. I'm Lisa Hayamoto. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning at Lion Publishers, and I wanted to just share with you a little bit about what we've been up to. Oh, I can do it. Thank you. Um, we already talked about this, but I made a slide just in case. Um, but yes, I want to talk a little bit about the route because that's a lot of what, what Lion does is we're talking a lot about what is the destination for a local independent news organization, which is, of course, sustainability, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. And one of the things that we do at Lion is help folks find their way there. 
Um, our vision is a world where independent news orgs are providing equitable access to inclusive and impactful news and information. And we get there through our mission, which is providing teaching resources and community to independent news entrepreneurs to help them build and develop sustainable businesses. So we are a membership association and also a journalism support organization. A little bit about us, we have, oh, 400 members, not 399. So um, we've grown tremendously over the, uh, the course of the last few years. We have a really vibrant Slack community where folks share ideas and successes and challenges with each other, um, 977 members strong. We have a really robust um, newsletter that offers really practical tips and resources for folks. Um, and we offer direct funding um, as well through our programs and partnerships. So last year in 2021, we offered 600 numbers, $600,000. And this year, so far, just up to where we are, um, 1.3 million. Um, our revenue growth since 2019 is 555%. So again, we have grown tremendously um, because folks are really seeing the, the great need and the great opportunity in this space. Oh, no. Oh, I don't old slide. Okay, well, let me just tell you a little bit about our membership, because I think you'll find that really interesting. Um, and now I'm going to have to do it all by heart. So I might actually cheat. So for bit, forgive me, um, because there are many numbers. Um, so yeah, our, our membership is really interesting. We are 63% for-profit newsrooms. So we serve for-profit and nonprofit newsrooms. Um, interestingly, we've seen folks move a little bit more toward the nonprofit space in the last year, um, but by and large, our members are for-profit and their number one revenue source is direct sold advertising. Um, about 64% cover a city or a county, so very, very locally based. If you want to count neighborhoods and states in there, that is like 80 some percent of what folks are doing. So local, 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 right? Um, about a third of our members are three to nine years old. An additional third are younger than that. And an additional third are older than that. So we're pretty well spread out in terms of how old folks are. And as you may know, in this, um, in this ecosystem, it's incredibly um, vibrant and growing. And there are new organizations opening every day. Almost 80% of our member organizations have fewer than five full-time employees. But I want to dig into that number a little bit. 14% have zero full-time employees, which means there is someone who is not paying themselves, who's working very, very hard to deliver local news to their community. Um, it's something like 30% have one um, FTE. And really, we're talking about like one, maybe two folks who are running these newsrooms and are doing amazing work despite this lack of resources. 33% um, of our members are founders of color. Um, interestingly, that has grown by 65% in the last year alone. So we are seeing a tremendous number of folks who are starting news organizations who are founders of color, often who are creating these organizations that are serving communities of color. The median annual revenue for our members is $125,000. So when you think about that in the context of some of the other organizations we've been talking about over the course of this conference, where we're talking like many, many millions of dollars, you know, that may seem a little, a little daunting, but I do want you to know that that number has grown by 33% in the last year alone. So there is progress, there is growth, there is optimism in this space. And that's what we see at Lion every day. And it's really exciting. So here's what we offer. I'm going to go through this pretty quick because I can already tell I am hogging. Um, we offer community and oh, okay, this is this is an old slide deck. I should have updated that. Um, so we offer community and camaraderie. So these spaces where folks can connect. Uh, we offer programs and resources. So we offer asynchronous training, synchronous training, um, many ways for folks to to get involved. Um, we offer media liability insurance, which is a big deal when you are a small local independent news organization. Um, so that's been huge. We are soon to offer an online training portal. We do um, sort of industry mapping. We did a project Oasis. You may have heard from Janine Warner at Sember Media, 
working on one for Europe, already did one for Latin America. We at Lion have partnered with folks to create one for the US and Canada. So check that out if you wanna see even more cause for optimism in local news. Um, one of the things I wanna talk about today um, is a new program we just launched uh, a couple of days ago. Um, it's called the Lion GNI Sustainability Audits and Funding Program. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Oh yes, I'm just gonna skip through some of those. Um, so like I said, we're talking about the route here, right? Where are folks going? They're trying to become sustainable. What does sustainable look like? That's different for every person, every news organization. But there are some sort of waystones along the way that um, folks can aim towards. And that's one of the things that we're mapping out. And of course, the first thing we wanted to really do is define sustainability writ large. So for us, it is the union of these three pillars, operational resilience, financial health, and journalistic impact. And our, our theory is that you really have to have all three. If you're operationally resilient and you've got a lot of money, but you don't have journalistic impact, you're not super effective. Um, if you're financially healthy and you're doing great journalism, but you're burning yourself out in the process, that's not good either. Um, and if you've got impact and operational resilience, but no financial health, of course you're broke. And I think that's an area where um, all too many news organizations are, are, are in. So we just launched this program. We are so excited about it. It's a really sort of a soup to nuts um, guide for folks all the way through sort of identifying where they're at in their journey to sustainability, all the way to having resources available to help them get there. So um, it assesses where a news business is on the path to sustainability. It's a tool, right? Um, so it digs deeply into their operations, finances, and impact. We do that through a really robust questionnaire um, that gathers all of this uh, really interesting data and helps folks see, okay, what exactly are we doing with sustainability? Where are we at in these very particular areas? And then it surfaces context and nuance that's unique to each publication. There's no one size fits all way to run a news organization. And so that context and that nuance really matters. And so we surface that through really in-depth interviews with um, expert analysts who really dig into it with, um, with the news organizations who often say that it's the therapy session they didn't know they needed. Um, so it's a really great way to have perspective, right? A lot of times, like these are founders who are running these organizations. There may be just one or one of two people. And it can be hard to kind of rise up and see the totality of, of what you're doing. And so that's what these audits do. In addition, they reveal progress and next steps. So, okay, where have you been? Where are you at? Where do you need to go? That's often a really difficult question to answer as well. So um, we create a report at the end of every audit and we will be, we're really excited to be auditing 100 news organizations this year. We just opened applications um, up for that. Um, it is only available to organizations in the US and Canada right now, but um, we would love to, to see a world where this is more widely available to folks. Um, and Semper Media, for example, does some really great work in this area in Latin America. So it surfaces strengths and opportunities. What are you doing well? How can you build on that? What stage of sustainability are you in? Uh, what are the indicators of where you're at and what you still need to accomplish? It benchmarks your progress with other news organizations, which is really crucial. This is still such an emerging space that there's not a lot of ways for folks to know how they're doing compared to others, which is really, um, really great. And then we create a list of prioritized recommendations for next steps. So, okay, here's what you should do to build on this area, or here's where you should do because you've got kind of a hole there that you need to fill. And then critically, we then share access to trainings and resources that can directly help folks do that. So like I said, it's a real start to finish soup to nuts, helping folks through this sort of whole process. And we're really, um, really excited about that. So um, check that out more deeply. Oh, I forgot the, the other piece, direct funding to help folks implement then all of the, all of the news organizations are like, well, now I'm listening. Uh, yes, yeah, so like I said, really all the way there. 
So just wanted to share a couple of insights um, that we've learned so far. We've done 55 audits. Again, we're gonna do an additional 100. And the insights have been really interesting. Um, what we found, our theory of change, is that the path to sustainability really has to start with operational resilience. What do I mean by that? I mean the systems, the structures, the workflows that allow folks to do the work, right? This is that foundation. This is like the, the stuff you don't think about until it breaks, right? The pipes of your house, the electrical wiring, it all needs to work. Um, and it tends to be a real low priority for folks. This is a stuff that's hard to do, um, but it also creates the most pain points. And so when you really start to shore up that operational foundation, you become in a really good position to build that financial health and to increase that journalistic impact. Um, interestingly, so far we've found, this isn't totally all the way out developed, but this is my sort of anecdotal sense. This is the case regardless of the publication's age and stage. So everybody um, needs you know, support in this area. And that sustainability is about small strategic steps, not big, huge game-changing leaps, right? It's that sort of additive power that adds up to something strong, that building, right? And of course, as I mentioned, it looks different for every news organization. I will stop talking now, um, but I wanted to share a little of that with you and I'd be happy to take your questions a little later on. Thank you. I, before you start, Fernando, I just wanna remind everybody, um, this is a small group so we can raise hands, but if anybody wants to put questions on Twitter, we're still doing that. <laughs> so, um, you know, please, Fernando, please. Yeah, awesome. Uh, my deck is really fast. Can I just get a quick show of hands of how many of you are either using WordPress in your current job and news organization or are familiar with WordPress. Fantastic. Okay, so I won't tell you what WordPress is. I'll just tell you that Newspack- Too raised his hand. I mean, okay. that's- <laughs> uh, Newspack is the best version of WordPress for most publishers. Um, I've worked on a lot of CMSs and I can see the, the hurt in your eyes. You know that uh, CMSs are not things you love, uh, but this one, I think you just might. Um, so what is Newspack? We make a world-class technology and solutions affordable for independent publishers who serve their communities through journalism. We have 157 uh, publications all over the world. Um, you can see all of them at that link up at the top, raindrop.io slash Newspack. Um, we're growing every day. Um, what makes us special? We focus on performance. We are reliable. Um, and we are affordable. I think uh, Lisa's point about operational efficiency, it's one thing to control costs, it's another thing to generate and grow revenue, and Newspack helps you do both. So why are we performant? We're on the latest version of WordPress. Um, we are loving the Gutenberg editor and finding ways to not just make it um, a way of creating content, but also inserting calls to action for newsletters and uh, donations, uh, subscriptions, campaigns. Um, it's well beyond story generation. Um, we're also open source. Um, if you are working at an organization that has a homespun, bespoke, closed source CMS, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you know that your support is somewhat limited because it depends on the company that's providing you with that service. Um, Newspack itself is open source. What we offer is hosted support. Um, also integrations. We're somewhat opinionated about what we think is the optimal way to publish or the optimal way to structure content. But we know, as um, Elisa and Emily mentioned, everyone is at a different stage of maturity, right? So you may have a CRM. You may not know what a CRM is. We wanna focus on the integrations rather than forcing you into something that may not be a solution. And finally, um, we build and buy. So if we are serving our 157 publishers and they are telling us they need a tool, we work on building that tool. If there's another tool that already exists, Gravity Forms, we're not gonna build a better one. Events Calendar Pro, we're not gonna build a better one will buy the licenses so that publishers can use those at no cost. How are we affordable? Free migration, if you're coming from WordPress. We've learned 
the ins and outs and the pain and the darkness in Drupal and Joomla. Um, so uh, we work with publishers who are coming from a number of different CMSs, but if you're coming from WordPress, the migration is free. Our migrations take about three months. Um, I was just doing a uh, migration with El Libero in Chile, which took six months. Um, we lovingly called that site El Pulpo Artesanal, which is Spanish for the Kraken. Um, we also have no contracts, so it's month to month. Um, we have an extremely low churn rate, but we're not trying to lock you in for multiple year deals. If you're not happy, you can leave, you can take your site, you can take your content. Um, we want, I, I tell folks, uh, when I'm helping understand, helping understand what is their uh, problem, what are their goals, that we're looking for a fit. I'm not trying to close a deal. Um, I'm not running against some numbers and trying to just get that 157 to be 1,000, though that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, there's no rev share. We have flat pricing. So as you grow, you keep more of the money that you're making. Um, and we are way less than any FTE. Our engineers are automatic engineers. So the folks that are working on our tools are people who work on WordPress uh, uh, technology. Um, our most affordable tier is $750 a month. Our most expensive tier is $2,500 a month, which is way less than an FTE, probably way less than a reporter on staff. Finally, we're reliable. Um, we focus on best practices. Um, we serve, work with, and fold those lessons back into the platform. Uh, the, the cost of the service is basically helping fund future development. We've got a roadmap that is 12 months out. Uh, we just delivered a unified uh, business intelligence dashboard, which for any of you who have been in large news organizations, you know that the marketing department and the business department and the advertising department and the newsroom all hate each other and live in different parts of the organization and dread the meeting in which they have to share numbers. Our dashboard does that for you in one place. So um, we're battle tested. Uh, we're, you know, finding out what works and what doesn't and folding those learnings back into the platform. We're on automatic servers. We're not reselling AWS. We're not reselling Google Cloud. The server's not in my basement. Um, and we are a publisher community. We are journalists and we're building a system for journalists to have operational efficiency, whether they're in editorial or in marketing or in engagement. Um, and as um, Lisa mentioned, we have a dedicated um, community of Slack support. So every publisher has a dedicated technical account manager. They also have access to all of the other publishers who are on the platform. So routinely someone will say, I'm interested in exploring uh, push notifications. Does anybody have experience? And 16 publishers will respond or I'm trying to move away from MailChimp because I've grown my newsletter um, subscription list so big that I'm not interested in paying for those fees. You know, any other options? Five different um, uh, suggestions. So there's a, an amazing community of journalists who are doing the exact same thing. Um, you can probably find hosting for somewhat cheaper, um, but there's nobody else who's going to have that level of access and community to people who know exactly what you're trying to do. What's next? Um, I'm here until uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, I'm happy to do demonstrations. Um, I was trained by our uh, lead trainer yesterday because uh, I'm running some demonstrations on Monday. We have standing uh, virtual demonstrations at 9.30 central time via Zoom. Um, uh, Newspack Pub is where you'll find more information on the plugins we recommend, the themes we have, our pricing, um, and as I said, I'm happy to uh, talk to you one-on-one. -on -one, um, and thank you very much for this afternoon. So um, it is a, a small room. I, I want to invite anybody to ask questions. Um, out, outside of that, um, does anyone have questions? Because what I think would, oh, wonderful. Go right ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, thanks. It, it was great. I have a question. Yeah, so 
Yeah, you do. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have worked with news publications from all over in our training sessions, but we're also, we can also help point you in the direction if you have specific questions. We just field, um, maybe we, could we um, put the email back? I think it was towards the end of that. Okay. Emily, if, because Go Fernando sp spent so much time talking about it, is there any cost for this? No, that, that's a great, um, yeah. that's great to talk about. No, all that we do is um, supported by people like Knight, by people like Meta. And so we offer this sort of wayfinding service at no cost to you. So with specific questions, and we get those every day, we can help point you to um, the right resources. Um, as far as trainings go, you know, we try to put together trainings around a cohort that makes sense, um, but we do, it's open to everyone, for-profit, non-profit, US and beyond. So use that email address and send me questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? I, I, I would love to also give each of the panelists a, a chance to talk about a, a specific newsroom, sort of where they came from and where they, uh, did you have a question? I'm sorry, question Mark? Yeah. Yeah, I'm one of your 399, now 400 members. Uh, we've been around a little less than two years. Could you say just a little more about operational resilience? You said a little more about it, but even a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know if you have it or not? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it actually is a pretty broad category. So um, it could be your tech stack, right? Like, is it working for you? Or are you working for it? Does it serve your needs? Right? Like, is it creating more pain than it's worth? It could be your editorial workflow process, right? Like how are stories or, you know, whatever kind of content you create? Like, is that process smooth? Are you automating things that you could automate, right? Um, it's, you know, how do you bring on a new freelancer? Do you do it by hand um, through like a face-to-face -face meeting or do you maybe have like an employee handbook or a freelancer onboarding process, right? Um, it could be, uh, you know, how, how are you keeping track of, you know, people you're reaching out to to see if maybe they want to donate or how is your membership product a program work, all of those like things behind the things that when they break, it's just, it's such a pain. Um, or maybe you don't even know they're broken, but you just know that you're, you're really just having these days where you've got like 75,000 tiny tasks um, that maybe don't add up to what you want them to. So that's kind of what I'm talking I think about. also too, we talk quite a bit about financial sustainability. There are a limited number of hours in the day. And I think this is a lot about how we use our times, time and the, the tools and resources that support us to make sure we use our time well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have a system in place so that you can take a vacation, right? Um, do you have a succession plan if that's what you're thinking about? And it's totally, as Karen mentioned, that big picture stuff too, right? Like the vision and the strategy, you know, is, is there goal setting in place? Um, how, how are your finances in terms of like, you knowing what you can do and knowing if you can do what you want to do. So um, it's kind of like everything <laughs> that isn't journalism. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa, would you talk about how much time it takes to go through a sustainability audit and then the work that that produces. Um, people are running newsrooms, people are busy helping their communities, people are very passionate about their work. Would you talk about that, please? Absolutely, yes. The sustainability audit process is long and in-depth on the back end. It takes seven weeks. Um, you know, we have analysts involved in all of the analysis and all of that. But for a newsroom to participate, it only takes about five hours. Um, so it's basically filming, filling out a detailed questionnaire and then having an interview with one of our analysts. Um, and that's really it. So I, I heard from a publisher yesterday who was like, whoa, 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 wait, you're telling me you're going to take a look at my business and help me figure out what I need to do and give me some money to actually do it. And it's free for me. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, yes, please. I think I want a question that somebody asked me today, and I hope somebody here has a better answer. I've had lots of people ask, should I start a membership program or not? And there's some great answers. But this person asked, how do I know I'm not just paying you? 
And I'm very curious about how you make that assessment and what are kind of those the hidden consequences that you might not realize if you start that with great fanfare and you decide to stop it. Any advice on that? Um, that's that's a <laughs> that's a great question. And with, without more information, it would be hard to answer that. But yesterday we did talk about how do we know when it's time to sunset projects that we are working on, and and frankly, we're all terrible at it um, because once we started it, when do you say um, this is a failure or we need to move on and this is stopping us from trying something new? I would say with the membership program, even if you have a few members you, that are supporting your journalism, it's probably better than zero. But if it's taking time, the time is taking to manage it, is keeping you from um, projects that can really move your org forward. Um, th that's where you'd want to weigh, weigh that balance. Is that? So what this person told me, and I'm trying to help them, I have to do this myself, is that um, they were spending more on a person who was managing the membership than they were making for and they were getting new members, but oh. very slowly. So they were trying to figure out, is this really the return on investment that we should keep doing? And one of the things I was trying to explore with them, I was interested in is, again, that public side. You know, there's this wonderful validation you get from membership. There's this wonderful kind of public credibility you get when you say we have so many members. If you close that down, are you going to lose something yeah. that has a value you might be underestimated? Well, well, absolutely. Those members are saying we support you. We support the work you're doing. And it, no matter, you know, I've worked at startups where we have 10 members to start, but that's really valuable for us to say you, you're, you're supporting what we're doing. It sounds like that this might be more of an internal issue of uh, the right fit for the right job. I don't know, Lisa, if you had any further. No, I appreciate okay. it. That's why I brought you you guys, it's, it's not an easy one to answer. Right? Yeah, but happy to talk through that with someone. So I know all our experts will take questions afterwards about the very personal and difficult problems that publishers and journalists are having as well. So please afterwards, um, Fernando, this question is, is for you. Um, what are the payment options for student media or schools of journalism um, considering using your CMS for their publications? Yes. Um, Thank you. Um, so right now we have basically one payment structure. So, you know, for student media today, that would be the most affordable tier, okay. which might not be affordable for a student media. We do have several uh, college papers that are on um, Newspack. So what I would encourage, um, I'm going to assume this is a student uh, who's reaching out. So there's two things. I would encourage uh, those students to install the open source version of Newspack um, because that is free and they can begin to play around with it. Everything works. Um, really what you get when you are paying for Newspack is the dedicated support, the handholding, um, the walking through of sort of plugging everything together. Um, but there's no barrier toward using um, Newspack like right away. And if they want to tweet me, email me, message me, I'll help them do it. Um, there's another company that provides um, academic plans, um, mm -hmm. but it's not Gutenberg focused. And so as a, when I'm not wearing this hat, I teach journalism. Um, I'm very focused on having younger journalists, especially using modern WordPress because of the Gutenberg editor, because there's so much that's happening there. Um, that they should be using that. If they're using a classic editor in WordPress, they should run very quickly away. Excellent. Um, and um, I think we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Um, um, Lisa, I, I would love it if you would actually give an example of a news organization that participated in one of the programs and ended up with funding because, and. I, I will say there's one particular newsroom I'm thinking of that went into it for the funding and found the coaching so beneficial. Um, so I, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, a carrot, carrot approach to it. So. Absolutely. Yes. Um, we ran a number of programs last year and into this year that um, are, you know, focused on training and coaching and then some direct funding to implement 
you know, whatever it is the program happens to be about. Um, for our sustainability audits, we just launched that. Um, so that's kind of like a, a whole new thing, but I'm happy to share a story about someone who um, participated in our first version of the sustainability audit. Um, and that is a person who uh, is really wonderful, is running a, a, a very lovely, strong news organization and is a, a real learner, right? Like wants to learn and grow and really wants to kind of do this well. And we did a sustainability audit and she was so appreciative because again, it was that sort of that perspective and that sort of outside look at this thing that feels so personal. And for many of our, our members, the, um, the organization is incredibly wrapped up in their identity. And so it can be hard to get that distance to take kind of a hard look at some things that may not be working or see what could work. Um, so this person was really struggling with burnout working too much, super stressed out, feeling like, you know, their organization wasn't progressing as well. And a lot of the notes that we made in the sustainability audit were around that operational resilience piece. Um, and so this person entered one of our programs and um, conducted some revenue generating experiments, but also some sort of internal changes that she knew she needed to make. So some of the things they ended up doing were um, setting, um, setting really specific goals, not just around like, we're gonna you know, grow our membership program by X by this date, but um, they, set, <laughs> they set goals around, around personal health. So they each came up with a personal health metric that they would know that they were like, okay, if they could like, you know, work out three times a week or eat dinner with their family five times a week right? Like pretty modest goals, but really important ones. And they started measuring those goals like they me measured their organizational goals. And it made a huge difference. And their coach helped keep them on track and helped them figure out like how to make that work and what to say no to critically, right? And what to be really confident about saying yes to. And so a year later, um, that person has reported that they are just feeling so much better about just their day-to-day -day work. And they've got their kind of operations in order and things are running smoothly enough that she feels like she can really now dive into revenue generation on a whole new level because she's not spending all of her time just like running in place, so. Okay, um, any other questions? I think we have one more, time for one more, if there's anyone or anyone in our a virtual community who's joining us. Okay. Oh, Jim Brady. Full disclosure. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I think yeah. you should repeat what he said because you can't hear Yeah, it. so one thing that uh, Jim is saying is that there's a lot of value in the partnerships and the vendors. So uh, every two weeks, um, Newspack has a publisher's call in which vendors, technology providers, third-party services come and present and oftentimes at significant discounts. So Parsley is a company that provides a sort of more human-centered approach to analytics that Automatic, the parent company of news pack purchased and so if you're a publisher wanting to use parsley it's like 900 dollars a month if you're a news pack publisher it's 25 dollars a month um so uh last week we had apple news uh talking with news pack publishers about the apple news plugin uh to you know talk through like how can they get their stories better indexed in apple news having literally the people who are at apple news talking through like email me so i can talk through your specific questions um so there we do have an ongoing uh, opportunity for pu for publishers to access those third-party services at significantly reduced costs also I'm going to throw the softball back to Jim. Um, there are grants available from organizations like Knight that can help accelerate. Uh, that, that can accelerate or, or sort of subsidize the cost. Um, and currently, there is a grant for US based publications for $20,000 that uh, I think the deadline is April 8th to apply. Uh, so like Wednesday, sustainable publishing, solutions. sustainable publishing solutions, and you can use that grant to pay for news pack. 
And if you were, you could pretty much pay for almost all of it um, at the highest tier. Um, our pricing tier is based on your revenue structure. So if you're a publication that's under $250,000 in um, annual revenue, you get everything for 750 bucks a month. Thank you. Thank you everyone for giving us your attention today. I, I do wanna say behind the scenes, um, Knight is really always trying to make an effort to talk to other foundations, to, to talk to other funders about the importance of journalism for communities. That's something that we, 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 we get calls to about how to support this work. And um, you, know, you can also send funders um, to us. Um, we've, been, we've been at this for a long time and, and we really work to be experts on, on that as well. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank <laughs> you.